Today, I'll be discussing the hepatorenal syndrome. By the end of the video, you'll be able to describe the pathophysiology of the hepatorenal syndrome, to distinguish it from similar clinical presentations, and to prescribe appropriate treatment for an affected patient. What is the hepatorenal syndrome? It's a disorder of hemodynamics and altered renal perfusion, the initial trigger for which is portal hypertension, and the final consequence of which is renal failure and sometimes death. Let me give you some details about the pathogenesis. Portal hypertension leads to release of vasodilators, such as nitric oxide, by the splanchnic vasculature, which leads to splanchnic vasodilation. To remind you, the splanchnic vasculature refers to the arteries and veins that supply and drain the intra-abdominal and intrapelvic organs, excluding the renal vessels. Once these vasodilators are released, of course, vasodilation follows, which leads to a decrease in the effective circulating volume. If you aren't familiar with that concept, it's the unmeasurable volume of blood that's effectively perfusing organs and tissue. Contributing to decreased effective circulating volume is hypoalbuminemia, as decreased oncotic pressure leads to fluid leaking out of vessels. There's also something called cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, in which neurohormonal factors and or inflammatory mediators associated with cirrhosis result in myocardial dysfunction. So now that effective circulating volume is decreased, this leads to two compensatory responses, activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and activation of the sympathetic nervous system. While these have the benefit of helping to restore systemic blood pressure, they do so with the price of renal vasoconstriction, which leads to decreased renal function and GFR. Also, activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone axis in particular leads to increased sodium and water retention above baseline, which is often noted at the onset of hepatorenal syndrome. As evidence that hepatorenal syndrome does not involve any intrarenal pathology, it's been observed that patients with liver failure and hepatorenal syndrome who receive a liver transplant without a concurrent renal transplant usually have complete resolution of renal dysfunction. Hepatorenal syndrome often occurs spontaneously, but potential triggers include infection, most classically SBP, and acute gastrointestinal hemorrhage. It's currently debated as to whether excessive diuresis or large volume paracentesis can precipitate hepatorenal syndrome. Some references claim that these are common causes, while others provide evidence or opinion that the association between the two is not strong and may be non-existent. Let's discuss the clinical features. Things that are always present. An increase in serum creatinine of at least 0.3 mg per deciliter above baseline. Hepatorenal syndrome is generally subdivided into two types, largely based on severity. In type 1, which is the more severe form, there is a two-fold rise to a creatinine above 2.5 that occurs within two weeks. In type 2, the rise is either less severe and or more gradual. All patients with HRS have severe liver disease, which is almost always either advanced cirrhosis or severe alcoholic hepatitis. They have moderate to severe ascites. And notably, these patients are, by definition, volume non-responsive. This means that when they are given moderate amounts of IV fluids, generally albumin, their renal function does not significantly improve. So now, what features are usually, but not always, present? The UA is unremarkable, including no significant proteinuria. The patient has either decreased urine output and or decreased diuretic responsiveness. A decreasing diuretic responsiveness noted over the course of several weeks is particularly characteristic of type 2 HRS. And last, a low urine sodium, such as a concentration under 10 milliequivalents per liter, and a phena less than 1%. Despite the existence of objective diagnostic criteria for HRS, diagnosing it can nevertheless be challenging. This is largely because the type of patient who is prone to developing HRS is sick enough to be prone to develop basically any kind of acute kidney injury. In my experience, the most notable etiologies of AKI in patients with advanced liver disease in roughly descending order of incidence include intravascular volume depletion, such as from overdiuresis, diarrhea, or a GI bleed, 
the hepatorenal syndrome, ATN as seen in severe sepsis, nephrotoxic drugs, and glomerular diseases which may or may not be related to their underlying liver disease. One additional etiology of AKI in cirrhosis, which is frequently not mentioned, but which I personally believe is more common than realized, is abdominal compartment syndrome, in which high intraperitoneal pressure from tense ascites impairs renal blood flow. When considering a diagnosis of HRS, the most challenging distinction is with excessive diuresis and other forms of intravascular volume depletion. In both conditions, the UA is unremarkable and urine sodium excretion is low. To distinguish them, stop all diuretics and fluid challenge the patient with albumin. If the creatinine and or urine output improves, it was probably primary volume depletion. If it does not, it's probably HRS. This is as good a moment as any to point out that within the pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal framework for AKI, HRS falls into the pre-renal category. This may initially seem surprising since many people use pre-renal as a synonym for dehydration, but the pre-renal category of AKI is more accurately thought of as AKI secondary to a problem with hemodynamics, as is the case with HRS. One more point is that strict diagnostic criteria also requires the absence of shock from other causes before conclusively diagnosing the presence of HRS. When it comes to treatment, the effectiveness of any is most dependent upon the progression or recovery from the underlying etiology of liver failure. There are two conventional first-line treatments. The first is volume expansion with albumin. The second treatment is vasoconstrictors, one choice here is a combination of midodrine, an oral alpha-1 agonist, and octreotide, a parenteral somatostatin analog, which is given subcutaneously in this situation. Does it need to be the combination rather than just one? I don't know, but it always is in practice, which is probably because the very small trials that have looked at this intervention have always used them together. The other option of vasoconstrictor is an intravenous vasopressor, such as norepinephrine, vasopressin, or in much of the world that is not the U.S., terlipressin. Terlipressin is a vasopressin analog that is theoretically more specific for splanchnic vessels rather than renal vessels, but it's not approved in the U.S. I'll end by answering whether or not dialysis is an option for patients who don't respond to albumin and vasoconstrictors. Due to the very poor prognosis of patients who develop hepatorenal syndrome unresponsive to medications, dialysis is typically only considered when either the liver failure is potentially reversible, as in acute alcoholic hepatitis, or the patient is a liver transplant candidate. That concludes this video on the hepatorenal syndrome. If you have not already viewed them, you might be interested in my accompanying videos on hepatic encephalopathy spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and esophageal varices.